Can I have another wine? You're listening to the Giggle Gun Podcast. I don't know what I'm talking about. If you want it, just come get it. <laughs> A Giggle Gun Podcast. Just myself, just be myself. For fuck's sake. You know, sometimes people pay me to say ridiculous shit, and sometimes I just say it for free. That's hectic. You're listening to the Giggle Gang Podcast. Oh, well, that was 2002, so we're almost 17 years now. Right. So. And how did, because why I've got you on is I wanted to figure out how you have gone from being homeless, living on the street, to now a very well-to-do gentleman that wears collared shirts and jeans and has a nice haircut. I wear collared shirts, mate, because with my figure I can't wear fucking t-shirts. Can't I? <laughs> have, you got, have you got saggy tits? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Everyone, everyone gets past 40, mate, and you're just like, Jesus. So. <laughs> no, but what can, can we go back and talk about how you found yourself being homeless? Well, I, I rented a, a flat in uh, Wally Range, mm-hmm. and uh, at the time I was living with my boss, but that became very awkward. And so uh, I moved into this flat, but back then there wasn't really protection for people who were um, tenants but the guy did advertise he was like uh, my own flat living with the owner that was all the advert so I was like okay so I met him moved in was paying rent my off the bills all that sort of thing and then it turned out he was actually letting the flat himself and wasn't paying any rent at all so by the time the landlord came around to evicting him he had upped and gone and taken his stuff and then literally the next day the guy was in the flat when I came home from work and was just like, where's Vince, as he called himself? And uh, I was like, I don't know. And I was like, where, who are you? And he was like, I'm the guy that owns the flat. And so I was, when I tried to sort of explain it, the situation went, I, I don't give a shit, mate, when you've got 15 minutes to pack your stuff and fuck off, or these lads will help you. And that was it. Who so, were the lads to help you? Well, they were just blokes that he had brought with him. Oh, right. So they're like full on down there to like do some damage. Yeah, yeah. And oh. I was like, trying to get his money out of this Vince guy or kick him out. But obviously he had got the jump on them and gone the night before. So Vince was collecting money from you and yeah. then, but not paying rent at all on the property. No, no. So he was obviously, you know, he, he was renting it, but then pocketing um, whatever and not paying this guy either. So... So I, I lived there about six months, which was probably obviously the, as long as the tenancy he had. How much was the rent? Oh, I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember, but I wasn't earning a lot, so I didn't have any savings because I'd left uni, so I'd got all my student debts, and I was uh, assistant manager of snooker all at the time, <laughs> earning about 12 grand a year, so it was like next to nothing. Right. Um, and so that was it, really. And then it was just like, well, I can't argue with these lots, so... Uh, and my family weren't Manchester-based, so it was just like... Were they violent or threatening when they evicted you? No, because I didn't really give them the chance to be confrontational, but when I went <laughs> You just got home from bloody managing a snooker hall. You well, didn't have time to be aggressive. Yeah, well, to be honest, it was like, what was I going to do? Mm. Again, it's like, technically five blokes, and like four of them and the landlord. It was like, well, you know... Never been much of a fucking fighter, so it was just like, well... <laughs> but then, like, even if you did fight them, you're still living well, exactly. there. And you're still paying rent to a guy that no longer exists. Well, like, exactly. So, like I said, he had up and gone uh, back down the M6 to Birmingham, I think. So Was he, was he a Brummie? Yeah, yeah. Because he used to go there during the week and then come back to the to the flat weekends. Because that's why part of the reason why I moved in, because I was like, oh, he's on never here. Mm. So... That's why, because he was hiding out the way of the person he wasn't paying rent to. So all that time, I didn't know that any time this bloke could have turned up and demanded his money. No so, way. And did he turn up on a weekday, the, the landlord? Uh, I think it was a Friday night when they, when they came. But like I said, he had gone the day before and emptied it. But, I mean, there was still furniture there because obviously he'd rented a furnished flat. But he said all of this was his. So all he'd done was taken his clothes and... Ah, uh, right. So, so we didn't steal it. any of the... F- mind you, stealing furniture is hard. Like, this is a furnished flat. But, like, if I was to steal this and run home, I'd have to try and get accounts through customs and then, you know, onto an Eddie had flight back to Australia. Yeah, well, it's, it's less complicated make... going down the M6. Yes, but, yeah. Um, no, he only had a small car. I don't think he was that interested in... <laughs> I don't think he did it all just <laughs> to get a free... 
Yeah, I love you. Doing just- it all just to get a free couch. <laughs> I love your justification not to rinse the furnished apartment. Was it? He only had a small car. He's like, can't fit a couch in the Peugeot two hundred six, mate. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And I, I don't, it would have been a very elaborate plan if he'd like looked online and thought. That's a nice couch in that flat. I'm going to rent it. So six months the room time. In. And in six months, I'm going to do a leg down the motorway with it on my roof. <laughs> so. I think that's a plot for a shit film that goes straight to DVD. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be in it. It's about the only time I'll make any money out of being homeless. So. Called the sofa surface. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what happened after that? You walked out of the house and then you had nowhere to go. No, I mean, I stayed with friends for a little bit, but then it was like, their landlord was like, well, look, he can't stay. Mm. So then it was just like, well, what do you do? And, you know, and I wasn't that close to my family at the time, but also some of them were having issues where it's like, they would have accommodated me, but they couldn't. So it was like, you know, it was just a, really a thing of just like, we well, just got to make it up. But then when you used to go to the housing office and sort of say about, explain the situation, their, their answer would literally be, there's a list of hostels over there. There's a the phone, ring them. And that was it because I wasn't... In Britain, they have this thing called like priority need. So all this thing about everybody who's homeless gets a house and all this and whatever, you don't. Because if you're over 18, you're not classed as vulnerable. If you're under retirement age, you're not classed as vulnerable. If you've not got a medical condition that's proven or a mental health condition that's proven, or if you've got kids or a female who's pregnant, you're not a priority to them. So right. it's like you sort yourself out. So and that that was their answer really. It was just like well, and, and but obviously everybody was after the few spaces. So every day you'd ring and be like, oh, we haven't got anything, mate. Sorry, and then just like ring again tomorrow. So then you'd go back again, and then you know. But obviously weekends the housing office was shut anyway, so you, you could only do it Monday to Friday. Right. Um, and there was a place called Men's Direct Access at the time, which under the current government got shut down. Um, but again, that was really difficult to get into because everyone would be there at seven in the morning, and as soon as they were like, had asked other people to leave or had moved them to a hostel, hence all the hostel spaces filling. So, when you're saying hostels, are these like backpackers' hostels? No, or? no, like uh, accommodation for homeless people. Right, okay. So, so, it doesn't cost you anything to stay there. Right. Um, and the one I eventually got into, they even used to provide breakfast for you. Right. Um, <laughs> I talk about it in the standard, but I shared a room with a guy called, his nickname was Sausage, and I just was like, oh, is it because you're small and fat? And he was like, no. So I just really like sausages. <laughs> and at breakfast, he, he was like always at the front of the queue, and they're all like, oh, let sausage go first. But then it was just like every time we were like in the room, he just used to like glare at me, so it was like he really insulted me. So it was like really awkward. And then it was just like, well... Sorry, sorry, I called you small and fat. But was he small and fat though? Yeah. Did he look like a sausage? Yeah, he was that kind of. Did he have like sausage fingers? You know how people that have like fingers that are wide. He was just wide. like one of those people who was just as tall as he was wide. So okay. he was just like a little human cube. But obviously, with his rounded head, he did just look like just like a little mini sausage. So <laughs> I don't know. That's what's prompted him out in my head when he said it. Right. So, but equally, I don't know whether I don't know my explanation for him being called. It was probably more less weird than the fact that he liked sausages. How so, much did he like sausages? Well, apparently a lot, if everybody had <laughs> nicknamed him it, hadn't they? So. <laughs> can, you, can you give a nickname to yourself? Do you have to be given a nickname? Yeah, I think other people do. My brother used to call me Howie, and he was the only person that ever really got away with it. I, I always hated it. Why? I don't know. And then one of my mates always... Some people do call me H... One, one friend of mine, Bev, she used to call me Harsh for some reason, don't know why. Then when I used to teach young people and I taught health and safety, they used to call me Hazard. Right. And, uh, <laughs> which, all sorts. and it never bothered me. I mean, I, I used to love working with teenagers because they were just so much fun. There was the people around them that were fucked up, all the tutors and the other staff. They were the ones that were, you were like, you need help. Yeah. The, the youngsters didn't. They were, they were cool at a point. So, <laughs> do you think that's concerning that you're looking at the teaching staff and the teaching young people, or were they looking at you being like, he's fucked up, mate, he needs help? No, honestly, mate, I, I've worked <laughs> in some charities, and you just think the reason charities can get away with paying little is because otherwise these people wouldn't have a job because the private sector would not touch most of them with a barge pole. I'm Why a, though? Because I used to work for a manager who used to sit at a desk sobbing because she wanted to work for the Gold Guide Association. <laughs> 
But there were no jobs going. And where was she working, guide dogs? Oh, I can't say where she worked. No, guide dogs UK. That you see still work there. And oh, right. There was another woman who, who used to see herself as a positive influence on young people, yet the fact that her own daughter was more wayward and more trouble than the youngsters we were working with. She was like, she came in one day, she was like, oh, my daughter's just kicked the windscreen out of the car. <laughs> and then she'd be like, then she'd sit at her desk sobbing, drinking tea. All her class who was supposed to be being taught at 9.30 would just be sat there, and at quarter past 10, they'd literally be like, has Sue stopped crying yet? And you'd be like, no, she's still crying, mate. It's like, daughter's kicked the window out of the car. And they were like, well, she sounds fucked up. And I'm like, I know. And, she, and she's the daughter of somebody who's supposed to stop kids being fucked up. The receptionist basically thought that kids didn't have issues, they just needed a fucking good slap. And the other woman had no sense of humour. So to get out of class, the youngsters used to start winding her up. And uh, they used to call her T-Rex because her little arms used to go up like that and <laughs> stuff. And as soon as they were like, you'd walk past and you'd go, oh, shit, Karen's T-Rexing again. They're going to kick them out. The next minute, a stream of youngsters would be kicked out. But because it was later in the day... They so was this get... at an actual school? No, no, it was like a, a facility for... Well, not a facility, it was a, 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 an organisation that worked with young people that they deemed had failed school. In my opinion, it, they were young people that school had failed because yeah. they were most of them were kinesthetic learners, so they learnt by doing... Schools haven't got time to teach by example and, and doing practical stuff because they've yeah. got grades to hit. So... A lot of youngsters were just weren't educated properly, mm. and yet actually, when you took the time with them, I mean, I, I ran a project for the airport working in Withenshaw, and everyone's like, "Oh, fucking hell, mate, Withenshaw!" And Joe you know was. I worked with about seventy-five youngsters in eighteen months, and there's two that I probably thought dick, you know, <laughs> and just like get out of my fucking classroom. The rest of them, total joy to work with, and you know, when old people are like all negative about younger people, the last we used to have. I mean, one kid, we were talking about equality, and he just went, oh, mate, if you've watched Brokeback Mountain, it makes you a faggot. And I was like, I've watched all of Harry Potter, I'm not a fucking wizard, am I? And it's just like, you know, and then they just sit there and go, fair point. And you'd just be like, that was it, done, done deal, it was non... And uh, I used to have a video of me playing Call of Duty, getting a massive, like, 32 to 1 things. I used to often play it, because if they like, like... Because you, you're older, you always used to think, oh... You know, like you're out of touch and all that and yeah. I, I, I'd put the video on and go any of you get 32 kill streak and they'd be like no no like, right, fuck off <laughs> so, but most of them got most of them you know got jobs moved on so how did hang on so, how did you get into playing Call of Duty oh I've always been a gamer yeah. I, you know I remember the old 48k Spectrum where you used to have to put a cassette in the recorder and wait for the game to load about four minutes I don't and remember. then sometimes the game would crash and you'd be like oh fuck's sake got to start again and, uh, but yeah, I remember like, you know, the, the first Nintendo that came out and... Is that and, with uh, the, the 64 with the cartridge in the top? Uh, no, there was one before that, and, and like before the uh, Super Nintendo as well, but yeah, it still had a cartridge on the top, but yeah, I remember Mega Drive coming out and all that. And what about GameCube? Did you ever fuck with GameCube? No, no, they, they, were, they were all pretenders to me. I quite liked the Dreamcast just because I liked playing Crazy Taxi. Right. Uh, that was, that I, only, I only had that game. Oh, well, no, Virtua Tennis as well. It was the only time Tim Henman ever fucking won anything because I'd play with him and he'd like, you know, smash somebody at the Wimbledon final. And he's just like, it's never going to happen, Tim, but I've done it for you, mate. So. And now, what, what, what console do you play? Uh, PS4. You strike me as a PlayStation. Yeah, never been persuaded by Xbox. Really? So, nah, nah. Is it because you don't like um, Bill Gates? <laughs> no, no, I've never looked at it like, commercially behind me and gone, hmm. So, no, I've just always had PlayStation. So, it, for me, it's just a natural thing is to just stick with what you know. Mm. So, it's like I've had Samsung phones for years. won't touch Apple phones. So You've never had an iPhone? You no, never I, have one, I, have one, I have one for work and I look at it and I'm just like, I can't even remember how to fucking get to this that, and the other on it so because people yeah. would argue that they're easier phones to use no nah, Samsung's miles easier yeah so just straight around it so I think my last six phones have been Samsung's so and uh, to be honest are you Windows laptop as well uh, no I don't have bother with a laptop oh really so I'm not that interested about you know I can read what I want to read on my phone and stuff like that but all this like 
I mean, some people are like, have you got Skype? Have you got this, that, and the other? It's like, I have WhatsApp, I've got Facebook. I'm like, that's enough ways for people to message me. I don't want you send a picture of you looking half like a dog or this, that, and the other on another what, a thing and another messenger doing it. And it's like, why would I want? It's like when people share a picture to Instagram and then share it to Twitter and Facebook, I'm like, I follow you on Facebook. I don't need to see the same thing repeated on five different media platforms. Like, just how fucking arrogant are you that you think everybody who's ever known me wants to see a picture of me and my friend Claire on holiday drinking a cocktail? It's like, we fucking don't. Give it a rest. And then the horrible thing is, years later, people go, hey, look, six years ago, do you remember when me and my horrible friend Claire drank a cocktail? It's like, I didn't give a fuck about it then. I sure as shit don't give a shit about it now we're six years on. So. Do, you, do you feel like that the time hop thing, the like remember what you did six years ago, it's more for young people than it is for old people because we haven't had that much life. Like six years seems like ages for me. Yeah, six years ago, I was like, I just left school, right? That yeah, seems but do you like, really want Facebook going, hey, do you remember when your friend wrote on your shirt in pen? People are like, I don't give a fuck. So, <laughs> But like six, true. When people say I'm a miserable bastard, I probably am a miserable bastard, to be honest. Harris but. Dakini has termed you as the most miserable man in comedy. Yeah, cheeky bastard. Uh. <laughs> I'm saying that when I bought him a latte at half past one yesterday morning on the somewhere on the M6. Um, so, we're going to call your podcast just Miserable Bastard. Yeah, miserable old fuck. <laughs> so. Have you got any other things you're angry about? Loads of stuff. Loads okay. of stuff. I, I keep it all bottled in. I mean, it's like. I want, I want you to set it free. And, cause we're gonna Stuff like Pride Marches, that irritates me. Right. Now, you are a gay man. Yeah. So you're all but, right. Because if I say I've got a problem with Pride Marches, then I get, well, I, I get lumped in with a certain group of people. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I do. I am sometimes a bit on the side of the homophobes. Because you get those people who are like, they go on about it all the time. But you know, like they get on a bus and they're like, mm, one homosexual to town, please drive. It's like, he doesn't need to know. So I stopped telling everybody. It's like straight people don't walk around and well, exactly. If a straight guy walked into an office and started going, "I'd fuck her," "I've smashed her," "I want that one," they'd be like, "Dude, this is inappropriate." And yet, apparently, if you just walk in and go, "I suck cock," and I'm a man, everyone's supposed to go, "Yay!" And it's just like <laughs> it's not relevant to people. And so, and the thing is, with the early days of Pride, it was for you know, it was for rights. It was a, a, a movement and stuff. And now it's just seen as in my view it, it, it's turned very commercial you don't have to pay to go down the village you've got to pay to go and watch this 70 quid this year's pride i've never been to one i've seen one parade and i've, I've never paid for the commercial side of it because i'm like you, you're turning it into a money-making business where where's all this money going is it going to further rights for other people it's and just going to, me, to put on the event isn't it and then line the pockets of the people that organize it exactly Hmm. So, so where where is it? Same with like a park life music festival, whatever. It just yeah, happens so, to be so, themed around so homosexuality. It, yeah, but then it's but it's lost what it was supposed to be for, which hmm. was fighting for equality. We're not quite there, you know. But equally, I do think when people just jab it in people's faces all the time, it's kind of I don't know. I think sometimes people just get a bit kind of like, all right, hmm. you know. And uh, I don't know. I, I I suppose I come from a generation where it was kind of. I kept it to yourself a bit more. It wasn't, you know, things weren't quite so open-minded. But it is sometimes you just sort of think, you know, there are places in the world where it's like it's still illegal and it's horrific, and you think, well, we should be doing stuff to support those people and mm-hmm. stuff, and you know, and try and use influence elsewhere and stuff, rather than just watching a group of lesbians with the tits out walk down Dean's Gate. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not really sure what what why is that relevant. <laughs> Do you think do you think Manchester is a like good place to be with the village and Canal Street and Yeah, but that's changed now because I mean god years ago when I used to go it was it was very gay and it was like the most stylish bit of town and stuff and yeah some of them you know a lot of the bars were independent and they got bought out by chains because of you know the the money of it and then it started getting invaded by people who were like oh it's cool to go down there and all that, you know, and it's like, got to a point where, like... They what do you start, mean it's cool to go down there? Because people were just like, hey, I've got a friend who's gay. It was all that shit. And right. so it was like... So then... And I think the last time I went, there was just, like, two fat 
chav girls brawling over chicks to one throw up and I was like well this is nice isn't it <laughs> it's like just, just fuck off somewhere else it's like you know I remember my first ever night um, <laughs> I've started telling the story recently but me and my mate um, we'd driven up from Stoke and it was a Sunday night and it was when uh, bars used to still have like on a Sunday night they used to have like last orders at 11 o'clock and sh- you know at quarter past 10 or whatever and shut by 11 and it taken us out to find the bloody place that so we'd it was literally about half nine when we got there and we were like fucking hell travelled all this way for one hour and so we sort of said to this guy we were like well where can we go and he was like and the bar that's now vanilla used to be uh, called Dots, and it was a piano bar run by two drag queens. <coughs> and we were like, and this guy was like, just go around there and uh, tell them Nigel sent you. And we were like, okay. And so, and it was all very cloaky and dagger. You with? Uh, my mate I used to uh, work with. Right. And, um, and I'd not long come out, so I was early 20s. And we sort of knocked on this door, and it was like, it was like the 50s, this little panel opened on the door, and this huge pair of fake eyelashes peered out and went, yes. We went, uh, we've been told we can get a late drink here. And uh, you had probably about 15 bolts all clunking open on this door. And the door flung open, there's these two gigantic drag queens who just went, and who the fuck told you that? <laughs> we were like, uh, <clears throat> Nigel at Via Fossa. And she like dragged us in quick, shut the door. And uh, it this was- This is what, in Manchester? Yeah. What? And it was one of the most incredible nights ever because <clears throat> one of them played the piano, one of them sang, and they, it wasn't all just like old and like show tunes. It was like U2, you know, other stuff like... And how many people were in the bar? Probably about 50. Really? Yeah. But like everyone just, had to get through this like secret... Well, door. some people had gone in earlier, but yeah, but then if you arrived after time, it mm. was... Uh, you know, but there was no windows on the place and so nobody ever saw in. So from the outside, they used to shut all the lights off so it looked closed. But then inside, there was this fabulous party going on. And then it was very odd because a woman walked up to me and went, can I, um, would you come back to, and I was like, what? And she was like, could I, would you get in the back of my, our car and let me watch you suck off my husband? And I was like, no. <laughs> And she got really, no. she got really offended and just went, "Oh, but we drive a Nissan." <laughs> so I was like, "Going to go? Oh, well, that that changes it, then, doesn't it?" <laughs> Sorry, I thought you drove a Mazda. Yeah. My mistake. It's like, you definitely struck me as a, a French car owner. So. <laughs> and that's the thing, and it's weird because people always have, I think people as well have an image that gay people are a bit like <clears throat> perverted, this that, and the other. And I'm like, I've probably had more weird shit from straight people than they ever have off other gay people. Mm. So, you know, because they, they think if you're gay as well, that it's like, well, I can ask you about sex and sex lives and stuff like that because, you know, you've told me you're gay and it's like, well, you wouldn't do that to any other Like, for minority. example, I, I would feel more comfortable asking you about sex because you've told me that you're gay. That actually is probably true because <clears throat> if I didn't, if we didn't have to have this... D- discussion where I'm like, oh yeah, Howard's gay. If you were a straight man, I wouldn't sit there being like, oh, see, so, you know, how often do yourself and your wife have sex? Yeah, exactly. Like, it just, it just wouldn't be appropriate. Exactly, and it, and it, it, it's not if someone's gay, really, just because they tell you that. Yeah. People sort of think, oh, I, I remember a girl going, mm, does it hurt? And I went, <laughs> what? <laughs> it's like I was like, being gay is not particularly painful. No, I was like. We're not tortured by the angels, you know, like bone riggers. For I was just like, I don't know, go ask your boyfriend. I was like, he's probably done it. <laughs> so I, I put my hand up, not saying anything that you've said, but I've probably been guilty of people saying they're gay and then me just asking inappropriate questions. Yeah, that well, I you, you imagine to walking into the office at work and like, I don't know, somebody's particularly chipper and go. Phew. Bang the week and misses at the weekend, did you, Dave, or something like that? They'd be like, well, you know, a bit put out that you'd ask. But it is, you say you're gay, and everyone's like, wow, so tell me about X, Y, and Z. And a lot of stuff that come out was like, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> Have so you ever been called brave? Yeah, mainly for doing stand up, which I think is weird. <laughs> when people go, oh, it's a very brave thing you're doing. It's like, it's not, it's probably mental health that's <laughs> made me stand on stage and a bit of self-indulgence, but um, it's weird, I, I, I had a psychiatry a few years ago, only for like a few sessions, and I told her about my desire to be 
a stand up and she went well when most of your friends and family have probably ignored you for most of your life she went that's probably why and I was like all right and then I went to um, I was still a bit offended and then I went to then I went to that, I was a bit offended but then I went to her and was like actually she's probably right yeah so so growing up were you not the center of attention that you wanted to be no nah, no nah. well, our family had a, a lot of issues so I was kind of dropped off the radar really hmm. and um so it's not like that now but like I said at the time it was so yeah and like I said I don't know the stand up thing to be honest it's something I wanted to do since being a kid but it was always that thing like I'm not really sure how to go about it I don't know what you do and all that but I mean I grew up watching you know Victoria Wood as seen on TV was one of the first things I was allowed to stay up and watch um, Blackadder we used to watch all of those uh, Whose Line Is It Anyway um, and then things like Drop the Dead Donkey that came out a little bit Drop the Dead Donkey. Yeah, it was set about a newsroom, and it was it's well worth watching. It was, you know, cracking bit and, and quite sort of very pointed about what it was saying about like politics and media and stuff like that. So, right. you know, people herald stuff like um, oh, I can't remember. So it was what. like a current affair comedy, basically. Comedy. Yeah, but it was kind of just set in like a, a, in a in a newsroom, but it wasn't like them discussing current affairs it was more about it was more about them and what they were like so uh, it was a bit like more like the thick of it you know that sort of so it's kind of based on truth but they're all fictional characters in that sense but yeah. um and it's weird because when i think back to being a kid the only thing that ever really stands out is all the comedy stuff you know i'd watch and stuff like that i don't really remember anything else and then when you get a bit older i mean i, I thought oh my way into it i could do degree in media and then you realise that the degree in media you may as well done a degree in fucking nail polish it's just <laughs> yeah, so so what did you do a degree in media oh right okay. I was like oh that, that'll get me into it and uh, I, I mean there were some practical things radio was my favourite and that's the one I always thought I'm not too bothered about TV if so do anything radio would have been and we used to do modules so we'd have to like produce them and I was always a presenter mm -hmm. literally anyone anyone else raise their hand to offer to be presenter I'd just be like can you just go and get one a coffee just like <laughs> disable the competition and just like put, go I'll oh, just do it um, so and uh, so was it student radio that you were presenting or uh, well more just like modules that we did for the for the uni so none of it went out live but then um, a few years later when I met somebody at Media City who was quite high up she went, well, if you can operate a camera or you can edit, then you're of use to me. She said, the theory of media, why the fuck would I want to know any of that? And I was like, yeah. And I was like, I think John Mulaney said it when he said about uh, to young people, stop going to college till we work out what it is, stop doing it. And it's like, exactly. It's like, university should be told, like, if, if it's not going to lead to somebody getting a decent career, stop fucking selling it. It's just... You know, they've become dodgy now because it's literally you can go and do a degree in almost fucking anything. And you just think, well, but we don't need all of this. Stop putting people into debt and then going, but here's a job in a call centre. Because <laughs> it's just like, you know, that's unfair. So. See, I did a degree in entertainment, in specialising in radio and television. And before I had finished my degree, got a job in radio also during the degree did a television program in Australia right then came over here and work in a call centre who <laughs> knew when you were doing all that training and, and I know because I got here and nobody gave a flying fuck about how yeah. good I was in Australia because it was all about who I knew in Australia and when I go back oh I'll just sail right back in it'll be fine yeah. but here coming to a completely new country I had no friends I had no backers I had no one to well, I, you know, I look my, out for me I, I went to uni in Stoke-on-Trent so <laughs> as you can imagine it's not the hotbed of media no and I got friends with a woman who was the receptionist at a radio station and she introduced me to one of the presenters and when I asked about doing like volunteering and work experience you went mate I've got 20 students here that'll make me a fucking cup of tea if I want it it was like we don't need any more <laughs> so I was like well that's the media saturated in Stoke then these 20 people so I was like mind I'm going to have to shag somebody or kill somebody but uh, it was like didn't do either well not being arrested for one of them and uh, 
But it was literally just like, so that was it. So it's just like, what a bloody pointless thing. But for me, going to uni was more about moving out. It was mm. just I wanted to be independent. I was living in the middle of nowhere. And as a teenage gay man, it was pff, nothing. It was like... That was, seems like a common was, theme here. Yeah, there was loads of... It was just, I lived in the village. It was mainly, surrounded with, mainly pensioners. So it was just like, well, you know, it's like gay nights on down at the Black Swan. So they were literally, if there was... It was probably them crucifying one. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I was just like, oh, I've got to get out of here. So so I literally just picked something and somewhere and went, and that was it. Right. And did right. it did it help you? Did it help shape you? Are you glad you did it? Yeah, yeah not going to uni mm-hmm. in, in the sense of the whole degree bit and the debt bit, no. But yeah, finding myself and, you know, and certain friends that I've still got from those days. And yeah, you could, you couldn't sort of say it was all a regret because, you know, one of my best friends of 20 years is, you know, I met the first day of uni. So, so stuff like that's in, invaluable. So, so yeah, half of it I regret, other bits, no. So I just, <laughs> I just wish I hadn't gone to uni in Stoke because... <laughs> They tricked you. And they, put, they put a lovely picture of this street with cobbles on it and an old pottery kiln, and it was like Stoke on Trent, romantically known as the Potteries. And I thought, oh, doesn't that look lovely? And then the day I got accepted and we drove over the hill, I was like, what the fucking hell is that? <laughs> it was just like you know, like when they first see Mordor. Yeah. It was just like ah oh, balls. I was like, you're I lucky just... you didn't end up working at Bet Three Six Five with the rest of the population of Stoke. No, I run a no. I worked in a very well-known nightclub in Stoke. It, it shut down, but it was called Valentino's. Right. And it was, oh, it was hideous. Why? It what was, what was all, the worst was just, thing that happened? Just all the chaps that used to go in there. There was like... <laughs> I remember literally walking through the cocktail bar bit, as they called it. Was it <laughs> as they called it? <laughs> Mate, you want a cocktail bar? Fucking hell. The amount of people that, that had had sex on that sofa in there, it was just like, jeez... I was like, you need shots before going in there. And I just walked through and there was a girl wanking this guy up at the, by the fire door. And he just looked so bored. I went, either you're doing it wrong or that's not his cock. <laughs> like, he literally just looked so stunningly bored. Um, I worked there. Then I, I ran my first, sort of, well, assistant manager of my first couple of snoo crawls in Stoke. Uh, my shortest job in Stoke was four days for... Uh, oh god phones for you as they were single point and I worked with a guy that was always skiving and a girl that hated me because I went to uni and she had given up uni to go and look after her husband's children and so every time you mentioned uni she was just like really angry and they gave you a half an hour break all day you worked from nine till six if you went for a sig in the morning you had to take that time out of your half an hour break and what were you actually doing selling phones I was uh, connecting them and we got to about the Thursday, and she went, you, you can't go and have, get a sandwich at lunchtime, you haven't got time, you've had uh, two 10 minute cigarette breaks, so you've got 10 minutes left. And I was just literally like, oh, shove up your ass. <laughs> like, it really isn't worth it. And I, uh, you know, I was just like, just because your own life has collapsed, and you've realised that your boyfriend's a twat and his kids are shit houses, don't take it out on me. <laughs> So How old are you at this point? Right, about 21, 22. So I was just like, oh, just shove it up your ass. And I was like, literally just went and stood there for ages getting a sandwich and she went, are you going to come back and connect some more phones? I went, probably not, no. <laughs> so and then literally just walked out and that was it. That's the so, end of it. Did they yeah. pay you? Yeah, well, yeah, they had to pay me for the time I'd done, but I was, but the agency rang up and were like, yeah, I'm not going to offer you anything else. And I was like, that's fine, that's fine. And then I worked in the Odeon Cool Cinema uh, Odeon Cinema Court Centre when and it was when Phantom Menace was coming out and so Star Wars well, yeah but there were long periods where there was nothing so we just used to put each other on hold so that you could listen to Madonna's Immaculate Collection and repeat <laughs> so uh, he would just go just, so this is when people used to book cinema tickets over the yeah, phone yeah but then you get I had a woman phone up for and because it used to tell you which <coughs> cinema they were phoning for so you'd answer and you'd go like Odeon Cinema Brighton or whatever and uh, this woman rang up and she went, yeah, can you put me two tickets behind the counter and I'll pick them up later? And I was like, well, no, it's a, a call centre. And she was like, 
Yeah, but I always do that though. They always, and I was like, no, you've, you've not rang the cinema. And I was like, I'm in a call centre in Stoke-on-Trent. And she got this like really abusive. <laughs> and she's just like, well, how am I supposed to pay for them now? And I went, with a credit or debit card. <laughs> and she's like, well, I don't have either. And I went, well, we're a bit stuck. <laughs> You're just going to have to buy them when you rock up. Like, what do you want me to do? Drive, drive to fucking Brighton Odeon and <laughs> yeah. buy your tickets, put them behind the counter. <laughs> and then drive But she won't get it. And then she's like, I, I want to speak to a manager. So I was like, right, okay. <laughs> so I never even put her onto a manager, just put her onto my mate who was just like, yeah, manager speaking. And then he was just like, well, we can't do anything because we're in Stoke on Trent. And then we were literally, there was literally just past She should have like, felt sorry for you. You guys just were like, oh, maybe. we're stuck. Then she wanted to speak to a different manager. And we were on banks of four desks. And we basically passed her around the four. And when she finally wasn't happy, they passed her back to me. She didn't recognise my voice. And I basically told her there was nothing further we could do. And hung up on her. <laughs> and it was just like, what a fucking idiot. How long did you work there for? Just a summer, because it was a, 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 just a summer job. And then, uh, I suppose the best one, I did work in a theatre, but just on the cafe and on the bar, so you used to meet tons of Z-list celebrities. Mm. Some were lovely, some were complete arseholes. Describe so. a Z-list celebrity, not who they were, but like, are you talking about like people that would have been on X Factor? Uh, no, sort of like people that were famous in the early 80s, but now this was the start of the 2000s and late 90s, so it's kind of like... Yeah, we kind of, I recognise the name, but you've not been on anything of consequence in years. But what were they even on in the 80s? Were they One like of them on? was on TVAM. What was TVAM? It was like morning TV, so like oh, right, Good Morning okay. Britain now, but it was, uh, it was like that. Like One the of, 80s Piers Morgan. Yeah, one of them had started as a page three girl. Okay. So in fact, she was lovely and, and, you know, probably the nicest one we met. Uh, I actually met Britt Eklund, who was... A Bond girl played. I think she was Miss Goodnight, right. married to Peter Sellers. But she was really kind of like diva-ish about it. And I worked with this really camp gay guy, and he went, "I know you turned that button on with your ass in a Bond film, but you're still in Stoke on Trent in pantomime." <laughs> and it was just like she just sort of stared at him, and it was just like he's got a point. You know, and it, and it's like you are you are in a pantomime with Cannon and Ball uh, in Stoke on Trent, so it's like you know do all the Hollywood bit all you like but you know you've still gone shopping in B&M bargains like the rest of us that's right so. remember where you are exactly yeah <laughs> remember so. where you came from and look at where you are right now yeah and then and in fact it's Cannon Ball quite nice in comparison to her so I was like well I'll hang around with them instead <laughs> so um, have you ever done any stage acting no only as a kid mm. uh, every year the school play apart from the first year I refused to be in it and then I got measles because I basically tried to contract measles. So, so that you couldn't be in it? Yeah, because I want, it was Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. I wanted to be Swan and the Seven Dwarfs because there'd been an incident between me and the teacher. I'm like five years of age. There'd been an incident where I basically told her to piss off. And so she so you've like, been miserable since you were even old? <laughs> no, I'm miserable, just nasty. Right? So, you know, <laughs> Spiteful. I'm quite happy in my nastiness. That's the thing. It's like, <laughs> People think just because I don't smile, I'm reveling in misery, and it's like, I'm not, I'm just quite horrible, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that. I've been single 12 years, I'm quite cool with that, you know, people are always like, oh, it's time you dated, and like, it's not. When was the last time you had a date? 12 years ago? No, no. I went to one last year, and we got to about date six, and I was like, he was like, we'd come back from down the beach, and he was just like, so, till next time, and I went, I can't be asked to be honest. And I was like, look, it's not anything against you, but I'm like, I just can't really be bothered. And he was like, did you not enjoy the day at the beach? I was like, yeah, it's fine. It's, you know, but... <laughs> this it. must be what my missus goes through, because she'll often ask me, she'll be like, oh, how was breakfast? Or, and, how was, and I was like, yeah, it was all right. Like, but for me, all right is like, good, like, it's all right, like, there's no problems with it. But she thinks all right is like bad, like negative, like it was just all right. So dating you would be an absolute nightmare because I go, oh yeah, it was all right. At least I've got some excitement, some inflection in the voice. Mate, we'd get to about the third date and I'd have probably dumped you anyway. <laughs> so I can't be asked this either. <laughs> so, so the weird thing is, I, uh, people have this perception. It, like I said, it's just, I'm not an overly smiley person, but inside I'm not necessarily sat there thinking horrible things or whatever. Yeah. Um, you know, like many comics, I do suffer with a bit of, 
you know, the self-confidence, self-esteem things and stuff like that. Stand-up is amazing, but in my own head, I'll always be my worst critic. So mm. somebody will go, oh, that was a really good gig, but part of me will be just like, oh, but you need to do better, or you need to do this, or you need to... But then I remind myself, it's still quite early doors, you know, really for me. It's not, you know, I've done 70-something gigs in around about two years, so, you know, other people do over 100 in their first year and stuff. And then, But then you start thinking, but we're all at different... At points, so that somebody might take ten years to get good, but mm. then rock it off and be the best thing going. Whereas somebody may have success early doors, but five years later burn out and go nowhere. So I think it's you know. But like I said, there's, there's, sometimes I play up to the little perception of me being miserable. <laughs> um, but equally, sometimes with a gig, I, I, I did go through a phase last year in particular where I was getting really bad stage fright. So when people were like at gigs and people were like, oh, you seem a bit, and it's like, because in my own head, I was just going through like a complete thing of like, oh, fuck, what if I die my arse and what if this don't work and all that. And that will be going on in my head all the time. And till the moment when I go on stage and then sometimes when I've died on my arse, it's because I've not managed to rein that back in in time and, and, and get it out of the way. Um, and then when you, that's still going on in your head to then try and remember your routine and be funny and this that and the other it's kind of like so and then like I mean end of last year I was like I'm probably not going to do this anymore and then I had a a really nice gig with two fabulous comics um, and that went well and then since then they've all been decent so I've kind of like well I'll stick at it a bit longer and then a couple of comics who have some blind faith in me like do you want to do this one with me and I'm like Oh, it looks a good gig. Well, I can't quite quit yet then because I want to do that one. Yeah. And then the more I've done that, then the more have, have popped in. But I've been enjoying the MC because in many ways that helped me because it was like doesn't I don't have a routine to remember. Doesn't mm. you know? It doesn't matter. It's a different skill set because you've got to try and think on your feet. And sometimes if your brain's not in it, you know, you, you can come across as ropey MC. But um, I think that's starting to get a bit better because I'm starting to have a little bit more faith in myself in it. So, um, but stand-up's probably been the biggest thing I've done that's turned turned my you know life around and my perception of the world. Because the thing is with stand-up, I mean, it's like you meet so many ace people, and I think the thing is it doesn't matter if you're a little bit fucked up because there, there's so many people that are a little bit fucked up. You kind of connect. And I probably connect with people more on the comedy than I ever have done in my office job or my day job because in my head I'm like, I don't really want to be here, this is not really for me, this is, it's completely alien to what I want to be doing. Mm. And when they're all sitting there freaking out because someone hasn't kept a spreadsheet up to date, I just think, <laughs> fuck it's pathetic. Out. Yeah. Do you feel like being a teacher and working in front of kids lends itself to stand up? <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, I don't do that now, but when I did do that, to be honest, it was a lot of the youngsters that used to say, oh, you should go and do, uh, you know, you should go and do comedy and stuff like that. Mm. So, and in my, in my head, I always thought, I will do one day, but then you procrastinate a bit, life gets in the way and all that. And then, um, but one of my friends was like, I've known you for God knows how long. And she's like, you've probably mentioned stand up and doing comedy every day I've known you. <laughs> And so when Why I, the fuck are you not doing it? Yeah, so then when I went and signed up and did the course at the Frog and Bucket, it was just... Because uh, I'd signed up for a couple of courses before that, but basically it was just like somebody had taken your money and not provided anything. So, right. And then with the Frog and Bucket one, I thought, well, they're, they're legitimate, so it's not going to be a money-making scam. And then, But then you met other people that were at the start of their journey and all that sort of thing. And, you know, Dave Williams was... A fab tutor who was just he gave you enough belief to sort of think I will do the showcase in six weeks time or eight weeks time it was you know and then from there it's just you then start making friends acquaintances and stuff like that and like I said it's uh, some of the comics that I've met you just sort of think they're such incredible people and the nice thing is you can learn off people if you don't go to a gig being all arrogant thinking oh I'm going to smash this I'm, I'm the best one here and this that and the other it's like the nights when you you know you could be the most experienced one on the bill but you get outshone by somebody on their 10th gig mm. and then just sort of have you know but have a look at that person sort of think wow what are they doing mm. you know and I think you should always do that I mean 
last year um, and start of this year I've, I've met some comics I've never heard of and then watched them and I mean there was a, a guy who just gave a, a, a couple of lifts to because he advertised for someone to drive him around a guy called Kevin Gilday from Ireland and uh, I, I must admit I'd not heard of him before and then I, I watched him on his, uh, his night in Nutsford and I was just like fucking hell that the delivery style and everything and because I'd seen him the night before I was like this isn't the same routine as last night so I'm like so last night he's delivered one <coughs> this has got elements of that but actually because we were a different crowd he's, he's adapted it he's added a bit he'd read the Nutsford Gazette and ripped the piss out of them because the headline was something about a man losing a fox and because it's like fox hunting country you know and there was a woman who kept trying to not heckle him but like talk to him and he was like about having diabetes and she went well should you be drinking and it's just the way he put her down in such a nice way I was like fucking hell that's skill you know and I was like that that you know class act to watch and there's so many people like that you, you just watch and you just think it, it, it's incredible you know watching another comic have a great gig is as it's mm. for me can be as much fun as having a good being one, the yourself. one yourself yeah, yeah. Um, particularly if it's a mate because you just sort of think you know um it, 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 but like I said it's the joy of it I mean I, I, I don't have a TV license at home because I don't watch live TV I, I only ever watch comedy specials on Netflix pretty much Yeah. so you know I'd never heard of Bill Burton a couple of years ago and then I was like <laughs> I've not heard of this guy look at all this fucking comedy yeah, I can watch and John Mullaney I mean he, I've, I've probably watched that Comeback Kid and Kid Gorgeous probably about five six times on each <laughs> um, just because it's just you know you watch something like that and you think that's where you need to be yeah uh, and, and you know but all you can do is keep you know trying to make each gig better than the previous gig I think so this has all gone serious isn't it this has all gone very serious I no. did I did have one rule at the start that I didn't tell you um, but it's this podcast we're not allowed to talk about comedy um, and then you basically just went on a went on an absolute rant and a tangent so I'm gonna I'm gonna bring it back round and ask you have you ever given any thought to what what you would do to dispose of a body I think the pig the pig root just feed it to pigs because they eat the bones and shit so okay you know do you have any pigs on standby no but they're around aren't they <laughs> are they <laughs> You could Google pig farm. Yeah. And just, what would the conversation be with the pig farmer? Well, I wouldn't. Just drag the body over the hedge. Oh, right. Okay. You know, and then... And because I'm quite a clean freak in many ways, people wouldn't associate that I would have gone somewhere so dirty. So mm. that's my reasoning, but... <laughs> and what do you think you would have killed the person for? To be honest, with, with, with being as nasty as I am most time, could have been anything, really. <laughs> to be honest. Just not like putting the milk back right in the fridge or... <laughs> what, do you live with anyone? No, thank Christ. Have people told you that you're hard to live with? <laughs> not the ones that survive. <laughs> no. no, I'm not really. I just, you know... I, I tend to just keep myself to myself. I'm not... I don't think I was ever a particularly bad housemate. But, like, so. would you get angry if, like, things were left out? Like, if butter was left out on no. the counter? I don't really like conflict. Okay. I'm not really one for raising my voice and stuff like that. I'd probably just put it away and then just plot your death. <laughs> I'd put it away and just go, oh, I've just put the butter away, mate. And then I'd just be like, tonight when you're asleep, I'm going to slit your throat. <laughs> so, I then wouldn't do it because I'm quite lazy. So I'd just be like, oh no, all the mess. Yeah. Up. <laughs> it's a lot of effort to kill someone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not the effort to kill it, it's the cleaning up after I can't be arsed with. Yeah. So, I mean, you can't get blood out of carpet, in. I love how much, how much thought you've given to it, but how uneventful your response is. is oh, I can't really be arsed. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is. It's not that I wouldn't kill you, it's just that I've got to deal with it after. Mm. And that, that's the thing. So it's not that I value you, it's just that I, I value me a bit more mm. in my time. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do when, when you're not doing comedy what else do you do do you like to read books or do you knit or you know do you go hunting <laughs> for gazelles uh, no gaming's probably my big thing okay um, but I do like um, I quite like getting out of the city since learning to drive and all that sort of thing it is nice to when no, did you learn to drive only about I think I'll be this June it's about three years since I learned really yeah interesting so and 
I only learnt it because I, need, I needed it for my for a job that I was doing. It was like a condition of it, and then I was just like, "Well, let's get it done then." Um, <laughs> so I passed first time. So, but I'm quite an angry driver, so I'm not, <laughs> I've not had an accident yet. I was just about to say, have you had an accident? No, no. I, I, I calm myself down enough. So, but it's people that can't operate roundabouts that annoy me. Mm. No, I and mean, you pull up at mini roundabout and there's. It's give way to your right and you look to your right and there's somebody sat there and there's nobody to their right so you like you go and I've, I've literally had people sort of beckon for you to go and I'm like just you've got it there's nobody there just fucking keep going it's like we all know how this is supposed to work you know enough to come to a stop and you know enough that there's nobody to your right but now we're, we're flummoxed and this is why straight people really need to stop breathing <laughs> just keep people like that off the road my problem with English roads is that there's too many British people on them. Yeah, faffers. <coughs> yeah, just fucking idiots, mate. They yeah. just can't be trusted. Um, I've got... in fairness, uh, yeah, mind you, you've got all that space in Australia, that's a problem. Yeah, wide lanes in Australia. There's never yeah. a, a problem with a narrow street, typically. Uh, and you keep your tourist problem down by just butchering them. So. Yeah, well, no, not butchering them. We send them out to the farms and they work for free. Oh, it was people that get picked up backpacking and murdered. There's not that many that get murdered. There's a few. Like, <laughs> but like, There's a few. We've you know, less, less people, less backpackers have been murdered in Australia than children have been stabbed in London. All right, don't get bleak. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a question for you, though. Can you guess how many um, automotive insurance claims I've had in my life? Oh, then how many accidents you've had? Well, yeah, ask, yeah, times I've had to claim on insurance. So I wouldn't count, like, backing a car into a pole as an accident. Would you count that as, a, as an accident? But it involved a claim, if that makes sense. Well, yeah, it makes sense. Well, I wouldn't really call it an accident. I'd just call it dumb luck. You know, mm. we all do that, but I don't know. You're going to shock me, so it's going to be something like 80 or something like 80? Yeah. No! You're literally just like bashing people off the roads <laughs> and smashing into stuff like you're some kind of like... I thought I thought six was impressive. How old are you? 23. Yeah, that is some good going. <laughs> to be honest. I did three in one year. Fucking hell. Yeah, it was bad. And then I lost my licence. Did they not think to retest you? Nah, well, like, I, so, <clears throat> when I went for my original, like, driving lessons, you'd have driving lessons with a driving instructor, right? And his name was Pat, and he had curly hair, but he was very angry with me because he had a better car than mine, and it was faster, so I liked to speed in his car, which obviously in a driving instructor's car you can't do. So then I would play the game of... If it was 60, I'd try and get from 0 to 60 as quick as I could, so the acceleration was very rapid. Um, and he basically said to me when he dropped me off, I said, I'm going to go for my test. Will you take me? And he said, I will not take you because you will not pass your test. And I was like, I'll show you. So I just found another person to take me to go and do my test, and I passed. And then subsequently went on to have a number of at-fault accidents. Um, Did you care anymore? No, I injured a young woman and her family though. Um, That's kind of you. But <laughs> I just basically just ran through a giveaway sign. She was coming over the hill. She didn't see me. I should have given way. She hit me. My car swung around, smashed the back of her car, and sent it off into a fence. So that was probably like the most serious one. That was the one where I thought, man, better start like toning it Learning down. Learning to drive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I learned with a. a my first one was just a crazy little Jewish woman. Yeah. And she was great, but she was. we used to argue, though, like a married couple, because obviously I was in my 40s and she was not much older. <laughs> and she'd go, um, uh, on that bit when you brake, you didn't check your rear mirror before braking. I was like, I absolutely did. <laughs> and she was like, you didn't, how would I watch? And I was like, I did, Gail. I was like, I had a quick look, and then I was, I was happy, so I looked back. And I went, and in the process, I looked in your mirror and saw you weren't looking. So and we were literally, we just literally argued. And, uh, but we got on really well. I absolutely loved her to bits. I thought she was such a good instructor. But there were bits where I was like, I absolutely know that I did do that. So she'd always be a bit snappy. So we'd end up literally just driving in rush hour traffic because my lessons were always at five o'clock. 
Just sat in rush hour traffic bickering. <laughs> <laughs> What's the point in sitting in traffic to do a driving test? Though? Like, well, I know, that person. did get me, because I was just kind of like, yeah, I've not really done actually much driving. I've just no. sat on Cheetah Mill Road for an hour and gone home. Yeah. So, <laughs> hence why the first three months, I was probably then thought, right, I better learn to drive while yeah. doing this. So, um, but no, I passed quite well. I had three minor infringements on my... Um, it's so much test, easier to get a driver's license here as well. In Australia, you have to do a hundred logged hours as a learner driver before you can apply to get your like. Okay, now and after all that hundred hours, you were still shit as you were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you should have got yourself a little crazy Jewish woman, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I just had Pat in his in, in his Mitsubishi Lanta. No, great right. car. It shows you. Said, uh, all right, what was my master? Master two, I think. Don't like a small one. So it wasn't powerful. Oh no, it was it was something like one point six or something. But I didn't need the power, mate. I was just sat in traffic. <laughs> so we could have literally gone on a tandem. Yeah. For the amount of looks learning I, I did in that car. <laughs> so and then in the end, because I'd started to learn an automatic, and my dad was like, "I'll pay for you to do one of those passing a week things," but it was like, "But you'll have to change and do manual." Mm. So I was like, "Fine." So I did one of those. And um, the, 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 the pass in a week thing. Yeah, so you go go to this place in Sale. I went, and it right. was you. They take you out driving, and then they do some theory stuff with you as well. And then on the Friday, you do your, your theory test, and if you pass that, then they apply for cancellations for you. Um, the thing was, the uh, driving instructor I had. This uh, guy cut us up, so the, t- the driving instructor beat the horn, and so the guy's glaring at me, thinking I've done it, and my driving instructor's like, raising his fist and calling him a twat and all this. Next minute, the guy's like, trying to force us to pull over. Hang on, the person outside the car? No, no the driving instructor who sat next to me, so I'm driving yeah, yeah, the car. Yeah, yeah, is yelling at someone? Yeah, who, well, yeah. A another, pedestrian or another No, no, car? another car. Okay, right. This taxi driver, I think he was sort of cut us up so he blasts the horn like reaching over me and I'm like well pretty sure that's not supposed to happen <laughs> and then we sort of end up alongside the taxi driver so he starts mouthing then next minute those two are like really going at it and I'm sat there like some little nervy driver just like is everyone still in the car though? yeah yeah okay. well, I was doing that thing of just like well this is awkward and then we could, and it's not like you could pull away because we were in traffic again so <laughs> Next minute, the, the taxi driver's offering him out for a fight. Yeah. And he's like going, you, you. And I'm literally just like, I'm not fucking looking left. <laughs> and he's like going, you, pull the car into the side. And I'm like, and I just looked at him and went, is it? I was like, I'm pulling in the fucking, I was like, and then he's like, mate. Pull in so your driving no, instructor yeah. can batter yeah, a fucking like, cab driver. No, this is a cab driver shouting, mate, pull in. Oh, right. Because he puts a window down, and he's like... I thought your driving instructor was no, like, mate, mate, pull no, and let no, me no, have no. him. <laughs> so he's got the window down, the driving instructor's mouthing at him, and he's like, and the taxi driver's like looking past him, going, mate, pull in. And I'm like, and then, it, it, like I so, said, just kept staring, just ignoring him. And was his taxi he, driver confident, like, brawler? Or? He, he looked as though he would have won. Okay. Out of the children, <laughs> to be honest. And then I, I was just like, so in the end, I, I sort of broke and looked across at the guy in the other car and was like, as if, mate. And uh, then he was like, dude, fucking pull the car in and all this. And I leant past and went, £950 this has cost me to pass in a week. I'm not wasting it on you, you prick. <laughs> and then the taxi, uh, then I just uh, then looked at the instructor and went, put the window up. <laughs> oh man, he put the window up and then we just like drove back to the test centre, well, not the test centre, the learning centre, <laughs> in like, uh, in complete silence. <laughs> and it was just like really awkward. And you passed straight away? Yeah, I did. 950 quid though, that's a lot. Yeah, yeah. Particularly to possibly have your teeth kicked in by... <laughs> uh, I'm an, you an, an angry taxi driver. <laughs> no, that was down, where was that? That was somewhere near Withenshaw. That's what made me a bit more worried, because I was like, you yeah. probably can't fight. <laughs> I've been around this area. I know, I know what's going on. Um, one more question for you. Um, have you got any holidays planned for the rest of the year? Uh, not at the moment. I, I, I do want to try and go to Edinburgh this year because I've never been. So we're not allowed to talk comedy. So 
I'm going for an arts festival, possibly. That sounds fun. Are um, you much? Are you much of a traveller? Like, have you lived in other countries? No, and I, I've never travelled much in my younger years. But I have. I've been to New York twice, and I've been to Barcelona twice, and then as a kid, I went to Greece and France and. I don't know, I, I mean, I used to have quite low paid jobs, so I was like, there's no spare money for holidays, it was just, you know, holidays were just taking time off work, mm. but uh, the job I do now is not bad pay, we do get a, a bonus every year, so last year I went to Barcelona with my best mate, and, you know, my bonus just paid for that, so this year will sort of depend on that, but um, there's so many places I want to go, that it's, it's, now it's kind of back on my thing, and the weird thing is, after working at the airport, I got over my fear of flying. So, because he used to have a bit of a thing of like, oh no, not what, doing that. What were you scared of? Crashing? Well, yeah, okay. yeah. But then I got to know some like like cabin crew and like a pilot I got chatting to and uh, well, I was just chatted to him and then my next flight as somebody that had been petrified flying was to do seven hours to New York. <laughs> and I was like, and I must admit the night before I was like, I can't fucking do this. And then I was like, yeah, you can't ring your dad and tell him that he's just wasted the best part three grand on a holiday for you so I was like I'm going to have to do it and then to be honest once we got over the Atlantic I was like you know like an eager dog in a car I literally just had my face stuck to the window the whole way going wow look at that look at that look at that and it was just like shit so I was like and then I quite liked it after that and once, I, once we were about an hour in I was like fine see I've never so. been scared of flying but mind you I was in a plane when I was like eight years old like it was just really normal well flying just, it yeah no 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 like the passenger I've never flown in a plane. Fairness, mate, by listening to the way you drive, <laughs> that plane probably feels a lot safer than being on the road because you're like, well, I've, I've not slammed into some woman and her kids. Well, it's too expensive to have a car here in England, so I don't think I'm going to drive. I think about renting cars, but I, I get nervous when I start asking too many questions. But the road works in Manchester, there's no point. There's no point, no. If you want to, mate, just, just take a deck chair and go and sit on the Mancunian Way for an hour. <laughs> You get the same driving experience as, as, as the rest of us. <laughs> Do you think the roadworks are going to pay off? No, it's just a, a money-making thing. Mind you, that's probably the negative miserable in me. That's right. That's yeah, I right. know it's going to be amazing. <laughs> the miserable old bastard strikes again. I know. Beautiful. Well, it's, it's because things like governments, councils and things like that, they never do anything for the good of the general people. Mm. So when people are like, oh, it's going to be amazing, it's like, it's not, it's... You know, all that HS2 thing, it's like billions of pounds that's going... What's HS2? The new line they're going to build from London to Birmingham to Manchester. Right. Which is costing billions, which they've now said, well, they might not actually come all the way to Manchester anymore. And it's massively over. And it's just like, all it has been is a load of taxpayers' money to go into the back pocket of a corporation. Because then in a few years, they'll probably go, oh, we're not going to do it, it's going to cost too much. And it's like, yeah, it's already cost too much. So, so they've already started paying for it and they've not even started doing it. Yeah. Well, look at the current government with that, given a contract for cross-channel ferries to a company that doesn't own any ferries. They've got its terms yeah. and conditions from a takeaway website. <laughs> you see, they're not doing it for us. So, oh, in Manchester, look at these tower blocks. I'm like, they were supposed to be creating a skyline for Manchester. Well, they're all rectangular. So it's like, we're literally going to be the city of seven rectangles. <laughs> It's like, you know, no gherkin or anything like interesting. It's just have gone, uh, what are you going to design? And they go, that shoe box there, just what, like that. And then the next guy just goes, just take that shoe box in, mate. That's what they're after. And the successive companies of architects have just gone in with the same shoe box and gone, da-da, another one. <laughs> so, uh, I was very, and I love Manchester, but I just sort of think, give us some interesting, some exciting. <laughs> no, some, I don't know. Like a, a big one finger like that to, pointing to the south. <laughs> saying, fuck you lot, the north remembers. <laughs> fuck you know. I did what? a gig down in Oxfordshire last night and I must admit I did feel like sort of saying that. It was just a bit like, hey, the north remembers, stop voting Tories, you pricks. Yeah. So, and weirdly it was in the uh, former constituency seat of David Cameron. So. Really? Yeah, and I did want to go, is he in? That twat. <laughs> so. And then he just disappeared off the face of the earth. Yeah, well, the guy who runs it went, oh no, he resigned, and he said, but there's no love for him round here. And I was mm. like, that's weird, really. <laughs> I was like, because even when they found out he'd fucked a dead pig in the mouth. Hang on, is that, is that true? Well, it's supposed to be, isn't it? Sorry, let's say allegedly, just in case he listens to your podcast and he goes and fucking suing. What? Yeah, if he stuck his 
you know, but they found out about that and still voted him in. You just is that think, where that Black Mirror episode came from, where the Prime Minister fucks the pig? No idea. Might be. <laughs> Might be. I've not watched Black Mirror, so. Because <laughs> um, I thought that was a joke. No, oh, it was supposed to be. It's the British Prime Minister that gets like, he fucks a pig so that someone doesn't die. Yeah, it's supposed to be from his like his uni days in those weird clubs at the outset. Okay, thing. right. So not and, as uh, the prime minister. No, no, not okay. like. No, yeah, it wasn't like, like on, yeah, the, on the steps of Downing Street. Going, yeah. <laughs> For Britain, I'm gonna fuck a dead pig head. So <laughs> that no, it's probably like one of those, but it was just like, you know, but you found out about that and still thought we'll have him back though. Yeah, you know, it's. Uh, it's just like, you know, if you had a friend who shit himself at a party, would you be like, he's first on the list next time? You're like, probably, probably not. And so, but that's how you sort of think, God, people are so entrenched in their belief that one part is great and one part is evil that it's like you've literally fucked the dismembered head of a pig and everyone's like, yeah, still better than the other guy though. It's like, really? <laughs> who was the other guy? Fuck no, but he must have done something like, really? <laughs> Awful if, if, like, the pig head guy's your choice. <laughs> Must have fucked a piglet. Yeah. He's a, he's a, he's a nonce of bestiality. Yeah. <laughs> pig pedo. Well, look, Howard, we've done over an hour and we've ended on pig pedos. Yeah, well, that's where most conversations with me end, to be honest. <laughs> Always drag it around to the pig pedo angle. angle. <laughs> so. Fucking hell. Look, thank you very much for coming on and uh, best of luck with the rest of this year in stand-up. Um, that implies that maybe it's all going to end at the end of this year. The rest of the years are going to be shit, but this one, have a good one. Yeah. So. <laughs> Cheers, I hope you have a good three months. <laughs> Thank you. They're kicking me out. <laughs>